is a breakpoint instruction. So that's just one of those things that you try to try to remember. And um, on top of that, it told me that it, I reached a software breakpoint. Um, in order to actually define an instruction there, I actually pressed uh, the C key, and that that defines the function or the uh, the, the line of code here. Um, so this is somewhere in the middle of uh, NTDLL's address space. If I scroll up above, I see some referenced address. So this is actually probably the beginning of a function. So when you're dealing with obfuscated code, you're going to see a lot of this stuff where at some point there's, there's just a bunch of random bytes. And you might see little chunks of code here and there. Um, that's because Ida didn't define this for one reason or another. The only reason it defines this guy here is because, or it's actually, uh, oh. so it had a couple instructions defined here. Uh, it's because it broke here. So otherwise, this would have been just a bunch of random bytes, too. Um, you could get it to not do this. Um, that would exclude you from using software breakpoints. So the way this works is if you uh, uh, actually, I believe if you set a breakpoint, but you tell Ida that it's not going to handle software breakpoint exception, that it's not going to ever stop on your software breakpoints. So when we created this one here, that's actually a software breakpoint. Let's take a look. So by default, all exceptions are handled as a stop. The debugger handles it. Um, you can actually tell Ida to pass it to the application versus <coughs> to the debugger. So basically, Ida's Ida's controlling the whole execution of this thing. Um, and when when the operating system sees the the int three instruction, it says. Well, this is a breakpoint. Um, I've got this table of information. It tells me what to do in the case of any particular interrupt. And so Ida says, I want you to call me every time I hit an interrupt by default. And this, this exceptions window here, uh, it's under debugger options. And then you click on edit exceptions. This allows you to change how, which ones, which exceptions that Ida says, operating system, you make me in charge of that. I'll handle it. Um, so otherwise, when you're just running this program and it hits that in CC, it's actually not going to do anything. It's going to, it's going to just keep going by. It's going to say, uh, just an in three, I don't do anything here. The program. So, so you could actually put a CC instruction in your in your code, and it's not going to do it's not going to do anything unless you're debugging. So. Thank you, Veronica. You're welcome. Uh, Veronica was just suggesting that um, or on the graph view. Do you all have, in the graph view, do you have addresses? No. OK. I don't remember enabling them, which is really weird. Um, you can actually, so while you're in the graph view, um, oh, you know what? It's because I'm in the debugger. So when you're debugging, it's, uh, it displays them at all times. But in the regular view here, 
you can actually choose to display the, the address if you like under options, general, and there's line prefixes, and that gives you gives you the addresses. Now, <coughs> um, I'll let you guys decide whether you want to use it or not. But it might help you if I call out an address, then it'd be easier to find it. And this should be a pretty short one. Um, so I saw some some people had things labeled differently than me. Um, the function that's called before printf, um, but after the after each phase is this secret phase. We're actually not going to cover that in this class. That's kind of for you guys to, to do on your own, and you're more than welcome to ask me questions about it. It's kind of uh, if you want to keep playing around with this thing, you're more than welcome. And uh, my email address is actually on the on the about this course page on, on the wiki, and I can write it up on the board at some point if you guys want it. But um, yeah, the secret phase should be the uh, the repeating in, uh, function that's not input. And if you don't have input labeled, then let me know. So after phase two, we've got that's number two. Keep going. Um, we've got all input, and we've got our next phase here. Actually, I'm confident that that's phase three. So, so in this part of the lab, uh, you're gonna be introduced to the switch case statement. Um, that is, you'll notice that by a single block that's connected to a whole lot of other blocks and has this sort of instruction in it. Okay. So in this case, we're taking whatever is in this var18 local variable and throwing that, that in EDX, and we're using that as a, an index into some array. Okay, so basically, somewhere in memory, you have just a list of instructions or a list of uh, addresses. It, each one of those addresses corresponds to a block of code, uh, and so you might use this um, if you have like a menu, for instance. So you you want to have somebody choose from a series of options, you know. One through ten or whatever. Um, this this is the kind of kind of thing that would be produced from a switch case statement. So the other thing is um, scope scope of analysis. So what what is what is what are you trying to accomplish? What stick to come up with a goal and stick to that goal. Um, you're going to be faced with lots of different options, and at some point you've got to decide, you know, when you want to understand all the code paths, and when there are particular code paths that you want to follow. So, um, some things to think about. Uh, so, if there are any questions about where you're beginning, if if anybody isn't caught up to to how you get to phase three, let me know. But we're going to spend the next. Um, We'll probably go till. Say I'll just give you until 1:30. Uh, it could be a character, for instance. So it's an R. Now that looks like a T. You do R to yeah, like show that the variable of the character? Right. Yeah, I already have that Google ASCII table ready. I already have that. 
<laughs> I've reconsidered that. The, the, the hard way. So H will will change it between hex and, and decimal. And if it's some, if it's character, then it will change it to, to hex. And R will show you character. Oh, that's a good answer. I was right clicking because the menu also shows it. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so right R, click, it'll, yeah. it'll tell you what it's going to convert it to. Oh, I didn't notice there was a keyboard shortcut attached to that thing. OK, I'm going to pick on somebody remotely here. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what are the inputs to our, our, our answer here? What, what are we looking for? Um, how about Scott? Do you have any idea? Scott, are you with us? OK. Um, how about Sam? You with us? Is anybody who's odd? OK, OK. So Sam, uh, can you tell me uh, how many, uh, what is the input that we're looking for for this phase? Yes, uh, the types and the number and whatever. What do you know about the input? separated. First one being an integer, then we got a character, and then we've got an integer. Okay. And we've got some conditional statements and we've got the uh, and then we've got the switch case. So, um, can anybody tell me where the first integer is stored? Bar eight. <coughs> Bar eight. Bar eight. Okay. So, good guess. I'm sorry. Bar D plus one. That's correct. So, so just like function argu uh, function arguments, the the, the scanf arguments are going to be pushed onto the stack backwards. So you start from right to left. Um, you'll see we've got five push instructions before I call the scanf. And so the first one is var a. We load that in eax, push it. Then we load var var b, push that in ecx, or push that using ecx, and then var d plus one. So R D plus one. Uh, we could name this first int. Okay, but the problem is now our character gets that same name. So, what can we do about this? Well. Click on our, our stack up here, uh, and we do edit. No, I don't ever use the menus. Um, there we go. Functions, stack variables, which is also um, uh, Control K and Alt K will allow us to change the particular the particular item. Um, if you hit Control K, it'll take us to our, our variable here. 
and we saw var d plus 1 in var d. So the reason this happened is we have an integer, which is a, uh, a character started for var d, and then one byte after that starts uh, begins an integer. But when Ida sees this, it says, well, everything being moved into uh, moved off the stack is four bytes. Because everything on the stack is four bytes. Well, in this case, we're not really interested in all four bytes. We're just interested in one of the bytes. So I'm going to rename this. Input char. And I'm going to hit the D key. Okay. Now you can see here, before it said DD, and there was only there was only one item and then it one DD before bar eight. Now I've got five DDs, including this line with input chart. And if I click on the next line, which is going to be D plus one, I hit D. D, and one more time, D, that gives me a double word, which is specified by this. So DD is data double word, DB is data byte, and DW is data word. So DD takes up four bytes, DW takes up two, DB takes up a single byte. So now I can name var C. So, I do have a question on that. Uh -huh. So, it, it almost seems like the compiler later on, like two block down, deals with this problem. Okay. Right? Because if you go down just a tiny bit, you see this block where it moves um, that exact address of RD plus 1 plus EDP into ECX. Uh, back up a little bit. Uh -huh. In that block in the middle right there, it almost seems like it's dealing with it, and we have that extraneous var18 up there as well. Right, right. So that bothered me for a long time. So let me uh, undo what I just did here. I, well, I actually like this more. I was just curious, like, is there a is there a way that works better in Ida to deal with this kind of thing? Because like, it took me a while to just do it. Like, wait a minute, this is the same damn thing. <laughs> well. Um, See, the, the thing is that we're talking about two different variables, right? So right. you have the variable that you were using with scanf, and then another variable was, so So what probably happened here is we probably had an array of bytes. And we passed in offsets to that array of bytes to our scanf function. And then, then right here, once again, we used that array of bytes and moved it into this variable here. Okay. So it's going to look something like this. Anybody want to see this again? It's almost like you wrote like, you know, char 5, like what, you know, my variable char 5, and then just interpreted it later as a char in it. Right. So what you had was something like, We had bar D as the base um, is some uh, like char array, and it's made up of nine, nine bytes. And then we probably said something like let's scan that. So we've got input. And then we've got our format string. And then we've got so the first one was, I guess, right that RD one, right? 
Uh, we cannot see the whiteboard. No. Sorry. No problem. something like this. Okay. So your call to scan app would be something like this. And then you'd have bar 18 equals um, what did I say it was this guy here, right? So yeah, it's the first thing. And this is some sort of it. Okay. And there's some dereferencing going on. Uh, so, so you can, uh, sorry, typecast is going on. So, uh, so in a compiler, uh, when you when you use something like a char array, uh, then you want to treat something as an int. If I want to store something from a char array into an int, the the compiler's got to understand understand that and it will complain if you don't do something like this. So I would say So that's actually what's what's happening. So, so which path do we go down? Does it matter? No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. So each <coughs> each of these branches of the switch is just another another possibility. So you put in a number that is so it's checking to see whether it's above seven. Okay. If it's above seven, blows up. And otherwise, it comes over here. So, um, at that point, it uses the the bar eighteen, which was our our first integer, our first input, and you're choosing which branch you want to go down. So whether you give it one, two, three, four, five, six, whichever whatever you give it it will decide which one of these branches you're going down. And then, what are we comparing here? First of all, are these two instructions related? Okay. Not yet. Okay, so, so we're, we're moving something into bar one. We don't do anything with it. We just move this thing into there. And then we do this comparison. So bar eight was our second integer, the third input in the string. So if I were to choose zero, I would come down to this right branch. Um, and if we actually look at this, so I'm going to double click on this jump here. You'll actually see what this jump table looks like. It's just a bunch of offsets to addresses, um, and uh, just, it's just a, an array of integers, basically. So your input, your first input, is going to choose what offset within this array to use. So I choose the first one. I'm going to store 71 hex, which is actually the letter Q, and then I'm going to compare our second integer, our, our third input, to 309H. And as I mentioned before, 309H, you press the H key, and it converts it to decimal. So 777 is what we're going to put into our, our uh, input string. How do you change that to a Q? What's that? How do you change that to a Q? OK. Um, Josh is asking how I change bar 1, this line here with bar 1. 71 hex here. Click on the, the 71 hex, you'll see it highlighted. And then press the R key. R? Yep. That work? Yep. Okay. All right, so if you 
your, your string was something along the lines of zero, some character, 777, then we move on to the next step, bypass the, the bell explode. And this is where all the switch, uh, all the switch case paths merge together. So they, they all have this jump instruction to say, okay, now let's get back to, to the main branch of code. And we have var1, which we start up here. which is the correct character that we're supposed to, to input. And we compare that with our input chart. And should get us past this phase. So does everybody, did everybody come up with, with an answer for, for this phase so we can move on to the next one? Uh, so questions about this? Did you have a question? First of all, is there, a, is there a go back because I deleted something to the data? <laughs> okay. I will help you as we start the next phase. Um, yeah. So when I was doing the when I was doing the compare, so at the, at the one step where we were supposed to compare to an integer, it it was it kept failing the comparison, which I don't I didn't even know why, and it was and it, I had the right third integer. Do you have a new one at the end? Because it cut the last character off. So so oh so. In your input file, if you're using the answer file, because um, if it gets EOF right after the four, it says, oh, I need to cut that last chart because it's a new line. Exactly. And then you uh, read 52 so, instead of 524, for example, to be the last branch. So this is something where if we had thoroughly analyzed the input function, we would have realized this. Uh, the, the, the last character, as he said, is, is taken off the end. It's assumed to be a new line character. and so, if you don't put a new line at the end of each line, then it will it it won't work properly. It will it'll assume that you got the wrong answer. Um, so, and you can have any number of spaces. So, if for some reason you wanted to, you know, space out your answers, that's fine. You can do that um, because it does a loop and. If it sees that it's got an empty string, so it's going to read this in, it's going to remove remove the new line, uh, and then say it's got no characters in the string, it's going to keep trying to read the next line. Okay, so end of phase two, uh, phase three. Um, I'll deal with your question, Josh. After uh, any other questions? Okay. So we press G and go back to main. Is our graph overview or scroll down so we get to the end of phase three? Okay, now it worked. There we go. That was it. <laughs> um, we've got phase four here. Okay, so in this phase, um, this might be a situation where you'll actually uh, potentially want to use uh, use scripting. Let you know that ahead of time. You can try to do this by hand, uh, and it's definitely doable. But um, this is this is a situation where uh, having some sort of code is helpful. Actually, you don't have to even run it, but if you trace what's happening and you write code, uh, some sort of pseudocode that might help you to understand it. So just a suggestion if you have any questions about that because you're not, you know, you're not typically uh, writing code, I can kind of give you ideas of, of you know, the thought process or how to write some sort of code-like thing to trace your, uh, trace what's going on. But um, you're going to see recursion. So, what do you expect to see? Uh, Veronica, what are you going to see? In, inside our function, we know it uses recursion. Oh, oh, okay, I just don't get the question. I saw the recursion, and what was the question? So, in the 
Okay, so so in we're gonna we're gonna start right. the the bomb lab phase four. Okay. And it uses recursion. So, what do you expect to see when you enter the Recording yourself? That's what you're asking. Right. So, so you'll see you'll see the name of the function Inside at the top, the function, and then right. you'll see the name of the function again somewhere, somewhere in the flow of the code. Thank you. Perfect. So, we open up phase four here, and we don't see any recursion yet. No, no call to phase four. How about this call right here? You see, when I immediately entered the function, the the name was highlighted, and it was also highlighted in the middle of the code. Okay. So this is classic recursion in code. Um, so. This thing is just going to keep calling itself and doing something with the input. So have at it. Each time each counter. Right. So, so we have two calls to this recursion. And one is down the branch. Um, where we've accumulated everything and one is down another path. So we keep this up. So who knows what, what number would have worked so far. <laughs> so not, not necessarily the greatest approach. So next thing I can do is Go ahead and try to work this out in code. Now, if you've come up with a debugging approach that you like, feel free to bring it up. I like to do things that hard way. Do any of the newer versions might have conditional debugging or conditional breakpoints? Uh, actually, this version. Um, this version, actually, if you uh, right-click the breakpoint, hit edit, we actually have the ability to put in conditions here. Oh, okay. Yep. So, let's write some pseudocode. All right. So, this function takes in our input integer. Okay. No, for simplicity, I'll call it X. Okay. And at the beginning, we check to see if it's one, and if if it is, uh, if it's one or less, we go to the left. So we're checking to see if X is greater than one. If it is. We take our input, subtract one from it, and we pass that to the recursive function. Okay. So we store that in the to ESI. All that. And then we do what next? What do we do after the call after the first call? Why for the closure for section two? So we'll say yeah, so that works. We can write this one in many ways, but And we go ahead and run this thing with x minus two. So, so if the value was two, come into here. X is greater than one. Okay, two is greater than one. So, first two minus one, one. Um, so, because.
as we know, recursive one is one. And recurse two minus two is zero. Recurse zero is one equality. So we know if recurse two is equal to all right. So recurse three is what is recurse three? Just looking at this. Three. So it's going to be recurse two minus recurse one, and then recurse three or recurse four is going to be recurse three minus recurse two. So on. So rather than doing all the iterations, we get four, five, five is eight. 13, so 21, 8 is going to be to 4. So it's going to give us 21 plus 34, 25. So by writing some, some code and then doing the first couple iterations, we can figure out what is, the, what is the, the answer? So, any questions about that? Did I pick that too fast? Any questions online? Start out the low number and the debugging, then we would have a, a better idea of, of what the result was. So we wouldn't be doing all those deep recursions. All right, so that's all. Um, this is actually close to the time I want to break. Does anybody want to continue on? Take a break now, or go through one more of these?